special report from Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Jack Anderson. We stand today on the edge of a new frontier, the frontier of the 1960s. Tonight, the triumphant and tragic story of America's youngest president, his battles with the mob, the growing threat of communism, and the rising tide of third world revolution. To the united end that Cuba is free. He captured the imagination of a generation. He challenged a nation hungry for change. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. But on a November day in Dallas, John Kennedy was murdered. I couldn't believe that this young guy had been shot down just like a wild animal in the street. How many men pulled the trigger? How has this conspiracy been kept secret for 25 years? And why are people still being threatened and killed for what they know? Tonight, Jack Anderson exposes the crime of the century. From the rooftops of Havana, to the back roads of Louisiana, from Washington, D.C., to the city the mob built. You'll meet presidents. I was shocked. I couldn't believe it. Watergate burglars. If anybody could kill the president, it would be me. CIA operatives. CIA was blamed. Flamboyant lawyers. Lee Harvey Oswald left a suicide note. Convicts and corporate heads. It was more sexy to call it a wiretap. Private eyes. I worked in the Watergate for, Bush, for George Bush. And private citizens. The threats were even against my children. It's a roller coaster ride of power and politics that changed the world. If you want lies, go to the Warren Commission and the politicians who wrote it. Tonight, you'll learn the secret truth behind who murdered JFK. The President of the United States personifies this country. To the rest of the world, he embodies all that is good and bad about us. And when one gets gunned down, it is our right, the right of all Americans, to know why and how it happened, and by whom. In the case of John F. Kennedy, we have been denied that right. The government has sealed the most sensitive files on the Kennedy assassination, the key CIA files, the critical FBI files, all in the name of national security. By the time these files are jarred loose from the agencies that could be embarrassed by them, the information will be ancient history, and only the historians will care. But we care now. There was a conspiracy to kill President Kennedy, and for the last 25 years, there has been a conspiracy to cover it up. Tonight, we're going to give you the details of both conspiracies. Lee Harvey Oswald. For these 25 years, we have been told, officially, that he was a lone assassin, that his finger alone, for his own warped reasons, pulled the single trigger that killed Kennedy. We have evidence that was a lie. We have evidence there was at least one other assassin. And we have evidence that Lee Harvey Oswald was ultimately a fall guy, eventually murdered himself because he knew too much. We have evidence that the Mafia was implicated in the assassination of Kennedy, that Cuba was involved, that a CIA plot to kill Castro backfired. We know now that President Johnson, just days after being sworn in, conspired to come up with not the truth necessarily, but with a quick story that the American people could accept during the national crisis. And of course we know now that this investigation conducted by President Johnson's friends, who composed the Warren Commission, has been so discredited that it is no longer taken seriously by students of the Kennedy affair. In fact, the Warren Commission lied to America, either inadvertently or by design. Despite the lies, the cover-ups, the whitewash, and the misinformation, details have filtered out over the past several years, and we're going to relate them to you tonight. But before we get into the details of these conspiracies, you'll have to know who some of the players are. The characters involved and the complexities of the story are as numerous and intricate as a Tolstoy novel. So get used to these names. You'll be hearing them over and over tonight. Johnny Roselli, our central character, hitman for Al Capone, and the mobster who eventually revealed the conspiracy. Eventually, he also paid the price. Sam Giancana, the boss of bosses with the Chicago mob, the link between the CIA, the mob, and the Cubans. Santos Traficante, head of the Cuban underworld and Florida crime boss, the big gun behind the mob's part in the plot. 
Carlos Marcello, who ran the Mafia's operations in New Orleans and whose turf included the fateful city of Dallas. Now this reads like a who's who of the mob in the 60s. But there were other players. Lee Harvey Oswald, of course. The only man officials say was actually involved. Jack Ruby, the petty Dallas underworld figure, friendly with the local cops. He was ordered to silence Oswald. Fidel Castro, the Cuban leader, the target of the CIA plot that not only failed, but backfired all the way to Dallas. And a breakthrough in the story, Joseph Scheiman, legendary undercover cop, a man who sat in on the strategy meetings between the CIA and the Mafia. And tonight, for the first time, we'll talk about it. And finally, we'll be going live to Dallas to talk with Marina Oswald, who was then the assassin's wife. Tonight, in an exclusive live interview, she'll shed new light on Oswald's role in the assassination. Now, there's something you may have already guessed about tonight. Most of these people you see here are dead. Many died violently, knifed, shot, dismembered with chainsaws, all of them after the Kennedy assassination, and all of them probably because of it. So, in the critical parts of the story tonight, we have taken the liberty of using dramatic reenactments of what actually happened. Now, they are carefully reconstructed from government transcripts, police records, and eyewitness accounts. In a moment, I'll be back with the beginning of this complex story, one of the most bizarre episodes in the nation's history. And tonight, you will be the judge and the jury on this episode just by picking up your telephone. Dial 1-900-220-2300 to officially reopen the investigation. Dial 1-900-220-2311 to let the Warren Commission findings stand. In a moment, we'll return to Who Murdered JFK? According to the U.S. Census Bureau, almost half of all Americans are under the age of 30, about 46% of us. This means many of you, a great many of you, don't remember much, if anything, about the man and the president, John F. Kennedy. So we'll begin our story with his story. For those of you who are over 30, here are a few treasured memories. The Kennedy family was a Boston dynasty with a scrappy personality that often crossed the line between high jinks and high society. Joe Sr. made a sizable fortune as a bootlegger, yet he also served as U.S. ambassador to the court of St. James. He had a taste for power and groomed his sons for high office. Joe Jr., John, Bobby, Ted, all would distinguish themselves on the public stage. When a tragic World War II mission claimed the life of Joe Jr., John was next in line to carry the Kennedy torch to the White House. To lead us to a fruitful America, to a peaceful world for mankind everywhere, is the great senator from the state of Massachusetts, John F. Kennedy. Let me say first that I accept the nomination of the Democratic Party. The battle against Vice President Richard Nixon was hard fought. Against a candidate who reminds me of the symbol of his party, the circus elephant, his head full of ivory, a long memory and no vision, and you have seen elephants being led around the circus ring. They grab the tail of the elephant in front of them. John Kennedy uh, came into office in uh, 1961. Uh, with not only high hopes on his part, but on the part of everyone that worked for him. I was in the Kennedy administration as director of the Food for Peace program. The Kennedy administration thought they could do anything, that a democratic society and a great country like the United States could overcome any problem at home or abroad. Kennedy set a new agenda for America in space. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out, of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. The fight for civil rights. Where legal remedies are not at hand. 
Redress is sought in the streets, in demonstrations, parades, and protests. And he chilled the world when he confronted a nuclear threat in Cuba. Shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States, requiring a full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union. Above all, Kennedy was a leader. He gave moral conviction to social change. But Camelot was soon to come to an end, one dreadful day in Dallas. to stand by for a severe gunshot wound. The president's car is now going past me. The limousine is now traveling at a very high rate of speed. Secret Service men standing up in the limousine. They are armed with submachine guns. It appears as though someone in the limousine might have been hit by the gunfire. The sound of the muffled drum sweeps in melancholy waves over the hushed throng. A hush broken only by a stifled sob, a murmured prayer. A whole people is lifted up in common sorrow and ennobled in their hearts. Down this avenue of sadness they bring President John F. Kennedy, martyred hero, to lie in state under the great dome of the Capitol. Lee Harvey Oswald was the assassin. And second, the commission found no evidence of a conspiracy, foreign or domestic. When the Warren report came out, I, like everyone else, just accepted it. It was the official government report. It was only when I began looking into uh, the details of the uh, Warren Commission's investigation that I began getting a sense of outrage. 68% of the people in Dealey Plaza told by the FBI to commit perjury who saw something they will never forget, the death of their president in front of their eyes. They went forward and they told the truth. And that, I think, is the history of this whole case. If you want the truth, go to the American people. If you want lies, go to the Warren Commission and the politicians who wrote it. The character in the Warren Commission report, as you've seen, was Lee Harvey Oswald. He was strange, a contradiction leading many secret lives. Now, the person who probably knew him best was his wife at the time of the tragedy, Marina Oswald Porter. Good evening, Marina. Hello. Good evening to you, too, whoever you are. It's uh, Jack Anderson, Marina. Okay. The Warren Commission and the media have portrayed your late husband, Lee Harvey Oswald, as a crackpot, a misfit, a loner. Now, you knew him better than anyone else. Were they right about him? Well, at this point, I have to say that it won't be proper for me to portray Lee as an angel or put halo on his head. But all this um, crackpot and very derogatory statements that were made just simply to suit the theory of Warren Commission. And I, I was uncomfortable with all those claims, but I, I think it was just simply convenient for them to put those labels on Lee so he can fit the theory of the lone loony assassin. Well, let me ask you this. Oswald posed with the rifle that supposedly <coughs> killed President Kennedy. Then, after the assassination, he left it for the police to find. Now, he may as well have left a signed confession. Is it possible someone persuaded him to pose with that rifle, then planted it as evidence against him? Or do you think Oswald wanted to go down in history as Kennedy's killer? Okay, uh, is the answer to your first part of the question, are you asking me about the picture that he posed? Yes, uh-huh. Do you think okay, someone I, persuaded I, I, him? No. I took the pictures myself. I don't know how many. Maybe one, two, maybe more. Did he, uh, ask, did he ask you to he, take those pictures? He asked me to take those pictures. As an uh, answer to your second part of the question... Do you think did, he wanted to go he, down in history as Oswald? No, no, as no, 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 not. He said that he left for police to see it. Are you talking about yes. the rifle left in school book depository? Yes. Well, uh, I do not, and uh, nobody knows whose rifle this actually was, or he left or who left. We do not know. You think it's possible someone could have persuaded him to lead it or, or planted no, a rifle? Somebody could plant a rifle. 
It's not, it's not factual that he left it over there. Well, is he Nobody's the seen it. M Marina, okay. was he the kind yeah. of a man who would have wanted to, be, to go down in history as the killer of a president? I uh, ask myself uh, this question 1,001 times, and I never could believe or make myself comfortable. Even I never have a, um, I never could buy, um, I'm sorry, well, even idea about that Lee did not like or want to kill President Kennedy. Everything well, that I ever learned about President Kennedy was good through Lee, so I don't think so. Thank you, Marina. We'll be coming back to you later in the program with Did some more questions. Sense? But next, let me introduce the man who first made me doubt the Warren Commission report and started me on a 20-year search for the truth. He was not a good man in the civilized sense of the word. He was a hoodlum who grew up to be a big-time gangster and a professional killer. His name was John Roselli, Johnny to those who knew him, and despite the life of crime he led, he had a reputation for telling the truth. He was recruited by the CIA to assassinate Castro, and later he began talking. He testified before congressional hearings where he couldn't tell all and he talked to me secretly where he did. Now I started talking with him 20 years ago on a story about the plot to kill Castro. But over the years, his information led me to a much bigger story, the Kennedy assassination and cover-up. No, Johnny Roselli wasn't a good man, but he had a great tale to tell. Johnny Roselli, one-time hitman for Al Capone, godfather of Las Vegas, and Chicago crime boss Sam Giancana's right-hand man. I contacted Johnny because I learned he had a dramatic story to tell, and he had a surprising way to tell it. Johnny was very eager to be, uh, to be able to say to the mob, to be able to say to the grand jury, to be able to say to any congressional uh, investigators that he had never spoken with you, nor me, nor anybody on the column, and that he had never met us. So. Uh, Johnny's attorney set it up so that he would speak with Johnny and we would be on hand. We would feed the questions to Johnny through the lawyer. The questions were propounded to me and Johnny would answer the questions to me. Uh, in other words, I'd be a silent uh, questioner and you would hear the answers, but he would not talk directly to you at that time, though I know later he did have a number of meetings with you. Yeah. Over the years, Johnny and I met several times. At first he was guarded, but in time I gained his trust, and he began to tell me an incredible story. Supposing, just supposing the government wanted to remove a head of state or some big wheel somewhere. You can't pick up a phone and do that, you know. The CIA didn't contact me exactly. They contacted a guy I knew in Las Vegas named Bob Mayhew. Bob Mayhew, a former FBI agent, was in charge of Howard Hughes' Las Vegas interests. It was Mayhew who put the CIA in touch with Johnny Roselli. Sheffield Edwards from the CIA, who was my main contact, told me about uh, the desire to get rid of Castro and asked me if I would consider making a contact with Roselli. My friend figured this was a good deal. We'd win some points with the government, win some points with our own people. I threw my part in gratis. Hell, we were working for Uncle Sam. What the hell? Anything for Uncle Sam. All you do is tell your Uncle Sam wants it. You had Johnny. Anyway, we went down to Florida. You know, you can't work in somebody's territory without a proper introduction. Uh, it's just not good. you got to show the man some respect, you know? It's really important. For the CIA plot to work, Roselli would have to enlist the aid of Santos Traficante, Florida mob boss. But Johnny didn't know Traficante. So they brought Sam in to Miami, introduced him to Traficante. 
Sam Giancana was one of the most uh, interesting guys, uh, challenging guys, an arrogant guy, a real dem dees and dozer. Uh, he was a ladies' man. I never could figure out why the ladies liked him because he was so ugly. But he was a killer, killed many, many people by his own hand and ordered the killing of many, many others. We hooked up at the Fountain Blue with this guy named Sam and a guy named Joe. And we got the arrangements all together there. It was at this secret meeting that the CIA and mob hitmen conspired to poison Fidel Castro. Pellets, powders, capsules, you name it. The problem is access. Getting close enough to Castro to use the stuff. That's not a problem. Access wasn't a problem for the mob. They still had a criminal underground in Cuba left behind after Castro's revolution. They gave me some poison. And I gave it to a guy who knew Castro's cook. The CIA said this was some kind of drug. To make him look like he had a heart attack or died natural or something like that. There was a little clip down in one of the Florida papers, and Johnny told us about that. And Johnny said they went wild when they saw that he'd had an end. Well, apparently he'd just eaten too much at one of his nonstop suppers and had gotten indigestion. But it had not been, he hadn't been poisoned. And, of course, they were just uh, crestfallen when they found out that it was mere... Indigest, an indisposition of the stomach rather than an active poisoning, but they had thought that indeed the cook had gotten through and had gotten him. We kept trying to kill this son of a bitch. Six times we went for him. One time I went along. The last time, I guess, was in 63. We sent in three Cuban snipers. Belgian rifles, scopes the whole works. De la revolución, aquel compañero. Aquel que fue el máximo abanderado. Rosalie's startling revelation led me on a 20-year investigation of the crime of the century. But to understand this tangled web of intrigue, we must first understand its historic setting, which takes us to Cuba and the rise of Fidel Castro. What happened when the CIA, a Watergate burglar and Castro's mistress, conspired to assassinate a world leader? You can't kill me. Nobody can kill me. You'll find out when we return to Who Murdered JFK. Moment. Jack Anderson will return with startling new evidence and answers to Who Murdered JFK. To understand the intricate details of the Kennedy drama, you must understand the times in which he lived and died. For short, it was called the Cold War. Our enemy was international communism with all its ugly faces. Two years before Kennedy took office, during the Eisenhower era, one of its ugliest faces stripped off its democratic mask and revealed itself as communist Cuba, just a short bomber flight from the continental United States. America had already been beaten in space by the communists, fought to a stalemate in Korea, and was generally on the defensive around the world. And now, here it was, a communist regime, not in our backyard, but on our doorstep. No American, certainly no American politician, could be soft on communism, and certainly not soft on communist Cuba. 
During Kennedy's 1960 campaign, he launched an ideological war against communism. Communist influence has penetrated into Asia. It stands in the Middle East and now festers some 90 miles off the coast of Florida. Let all our neighbors know that we shall join with them to oppose aggression or subversion anywhere in the Americas. And let every other power know that this hemisphere intends to remain the master of its own house. Cuba in particular was a festering thorn in his side. Castro and his fellow dictators may rule nations, they do not rule people. John Kennedy had a kind of a fixation about Castro, an obsession maybe is a better word. He couldn't abide the fact that this cocky, arrogant uh, young man was in charge of Cuba just a few miles off our shore and willing to defy uh, the great United States. After Castro seized power, he was hailed first as a conquering hero, then branded a communist turncoat. Watergate burglar Frank Sturgis fought side by side with Castro, while secretly acting as a CIA informant. He was among the first to discover Castro's true colors. A Russian submarine uh, one evening came off the coast of uh, Cuba uh, in Oriente province and unloaded a couple KGB agents. I did take pictures of these two individuals after I took the pictures of the communist, uh, these two agents and so forth, when I found out definitely that he was dealing with the communists and with the KGB. And I definitely uh, really, really wanted to go ahead and, uh, and uh, do something to kill him. After early attempts to kill Castro failed, the CIA turned to more devious methods. Enter Marita Lorenz, Fidel Castro's mistress. By chance, I went on my father's cruise ship, the Berlin. The last stop on this cruise, West Indian cruise, was Havana. And on this cruise, I met the Prime Minister of Cuba, Dr. Fidel Castro Ruz. She was 19 years old and a real beauty. Fidel, naturally, with a 19-year-old girl, hey, you know, he'd, he'd crawl over a snake to get to a 19-year-old girl. At 19, she was old enough to have an affair with Fidel and young enough to be brainwashed by the CIA. I was asked to try to recruit her because she would be a very good asset, intelligence-wise. And I nurtured her along, and I finally did, where I got her in a position to poison Castro. They kept threatening me since they trained me that I wasn't good for anything else, that I had to do it for national security reasons, that otherwise there would be a war. She failed in that. And then there was two other attempts. I saw him uh, playing his music and lying on the bed, smoking a cigar. He said, did you come to kill me? And I said, yes. And he said, you can't kill me. Nobody can kill me. Though the CIA had been unable to liquidate Castro, they pushed ahead with plans for an all-out invasion. The Bay of Pigs was the disastrous result. Jack Kennedy did inherit the Bay of Pigs uh, scenario. Uh, he had made certain pledges during the campaign. He had chided Nixon for not being tough enough on Castro, and he was determined to show that he was a tough guy that wasn't going to tolerate this dictator 90 miles offshore. Promises had been made by the administration, by the Kennedy administration, and by the preceding Eisenhower administration that the invasion would proceed under certain circumstances. And uh, when the, that vow was broken, uh, I only interpreted it on the part of Mr. Kennedy as a, a failure of nerve. He was scared because Khrushchev says, don't do this or we're going to do that. You know, so he didn't do it and he deserted the Bay of Pigs. I was involved in the Bay of Pigs. Got a lot of people, friends of mine, that were killed in the Bay of Pigs. And I resent that. Don't play political games with me. I'm a military man. I'm a soldier. I go fight. But damn it, if I risk my ass out there and I'm getting shot at, I don't want some stupid ass politician to go ahead and w make deals behind my back where my people or maybe myself are going to get killed. I don't like that. After the Bay of Pigs, John F. Kennedy angrily said that he was going to break the CIA into a thousand pieces. I'd like you to respond to that. 
I think that uh, for him to have said that was uh, uh, probably a way of disguising from himself the fact that he himself was responsible for the fiasco at the Bay of Pigs. And I'm sure that that's something that haunted him for the rest of his days. Meanwhile, Fidel's gamble had paid off. The rebel leader quickly purged a corrupt Cuba. The Mafia made a deal with Batista to allow uh, a vast assemblage of gambling casinos, narcotics operations, vice operations to be developed in Cuba. And uh, just shortly before Castro took over, uh, the mob's base in Cuba was perhaps the equivalent of Las Vegas and Atlantic City today. When Castro took control of Cuba, he seized all the American casinos and all their assets. Once he closed the casinos, he closed up really the main source of funding uh, for Cuba. The bright lights of Havana's casinos dimmed for good, and the mob fled to safer shores, like the Gold Coast of Florida and the neon strips of Las Vegas. Unprecedented attack on the mob made headlines. Bobby Kennedy, during this period of time, was eating monsters for breakfast. But did their vendetta backfire? You'll find out when we return to Who Murdered JFK. As we have seen tonight, President Kennedy, with help from the Central Intelligence Agency, had made a mortal enemy just a few miles offshore. But foreign enemies have never attempted the assassination of an American president. The conspiracy to kill Kennedy found a powerful ally, and it was not foreign, but internal. This internal menace was merciless. It had a reputation for cutting down anyone who got in its way. But never before had it contemplated a hit on a president, but then no other president had personally gone after it the way Kennedy had. Enter the mob. For this bill is not a strike-breaking, union-busting bill. You're the best argument I know for it. Your testimony here this afternoon, your complete indifference to the fact that numerous people who hold responsible positions in your union come before this committee and take the Fifth Amendment because an honest answer might tend to incriminate them. In the late 50s, John and Robert Kennedy built their reputation serving on the McClellan Committee, where they investigated the pervasive influence of organized crime in American life. Uh, Mr. Heitler uh, was burned to death, was he? I declined to answer. Can you yeah, what ground on the grounds that it may tend to incriminate or lead me into something? Bobby Kennedy, during this period of time, was eating mobsters for breakfast. He was going after mob, uh, mob figures with, with all abandon. The investigation lasted from 1957 to about 1960, 1961. 1960, the year Senator John Kennedy was elected president with some unsolicited help from the mob as former FBI agent Bill Romer explained. The Chicago mob, uh, particularly under the auspices of, uh, of Sam Giancana, worked very, very hard for the election of John Kennedy in 1960. In the opinion of Bill Romer, based on his interpretation of government wiretaps, Frank Sinatra may have played a role. The reason that the Chicago mob worked so hard for the election of John Kennedy was, uh, as we learned over a microphone, uh, Frank Sinatra very strongly recommended to Sam Giancana that if the Chicago mob would work for Kennedy, that he, particularly through his good graces with Joseph Kennedy, the father of John and Robert, that he could influence them and, and uh, swing them around so that they would not work as hard on Sam Giancana in particularly and the mob in general. Instead of showing his gratitude to the gangsters who had helped put him in the White House, one of John Kennedy's first acts as president was to name his mafia-hating brother as Attorney General. I am uh, pleased to accept the position of the Attorney Generalship uh, of the United States. Bobby used all the weapons at his disposal, including the FBI and the Justice Department, as he launched an unprecedented attack on organized crime. The, uh, 
field of organized crime. I think it's a very serious situation that's facing the country at the present time. I think a lot of steps can be taken in order to deal with the problem. The Kennedys compiled a 10 most wanted list of the mobsters they were determined to bring to justice. At the top of the list were Sam Giancano, Santos Traficante, Carlos Marcello, and Teamsters President Jimmy Hoffman. Did you say that SOB, I'll break his back? Who? You. After say to who? To anyone. Did you make that statement after these people testified before the committee? I never talked to either one of them after testifying. No, I'm not talking to about uh, to them. Did you make that statement You're here in the hearing room after the testimony was finished? Not concerning them, far as I know of. Well, who did you make it about? I don't know. Then? I may have been discussing somebody in the figure of speech. Well, who did you make the statement? Whose back were you going to break? I don't even remember it. Well, whose back were you going to break, Mr. Hoffa? Figure of speech, I don't even know what I was talking about, and I don't know what you're talking about. Away from the courthouse, Hoffa confided to an informant his intense and violent hatred for the Kennedys. And during this conversation, Hoffa became very upset at Bob Kennedy, and he, and, and he said, uh, he, he announced that Bob Kennedy was going to be killed. He was going to kill his entire family. Uh, he pointed to a 270 rifle leaning in the corner of the room. He said he was either going to shoot him while he was driving in an open convertible with his dogs, or that he was going to blow up his home at Hickory Hill, Hill Virginia. Uh, with plastic explosives. He wanted to incinerate Kennedy and his entire family. The Kennedy crusade was unprecedented, but by 1963, thousands of mafia figures were either behind bars, under surveillance, or under indictment, but they were under such tight pressure they could barely operate, and they realized that this was the beginning of the end for them unless they did something desperate. I remember uh, Jan Connor on one of our microphones saying, this is, uh, this is like Nazi Germany, and I'm the biggest Jew in the country. Another mobster feeling the heat of Bobby's anti-crime crusade was Carlos Marcello, mafia killer and undisputed lord of the underworld in Dallas and New Orleans. Being stupid as I am sometimes, I started needling about the Kennedys. Geez, wasn't it too bad that, that Bobby Kennedy had you picked up and deported to Guatemala? Just to see what he'd say, you know. And then he said, hey, don't worry, we're taking care of that. And I said, what do you mean take care of it? He says, you know, you kill the head, the tail drops off. You're going to kill Bobby Kennedy for what he is? He said, no, you kill the president, Bobby gets taken care of. In 1979, during a televised session before the House Select Committee on Assassinations, the most direct mafia threat against the president was exposed by eyewitness Jose Aleman. Mr. Aleman and Mr. Traficandi met at least once perhaps on several occasions prior to November 1963. Did you ultimately go to one or more meetings with Traficante? Yes, I did. Uh, had uh, various meetings with Santos Traficante. I'm sorry, Jose. Hoffa can't get you the loan. He's having problems with the Kennedy brothers again. So he suggested he could help you by securing a Teamsters loan for a condominium project you were interested in. Correct. Alpha could not secure the loan so far because he had a lot of troubles with uh, the brothers Kennedy. He was very much upset. Very, about, uh, very much upset about what Kennedy had been doing to Hoffa and he felt uh, sympathetic towards Hoffa, described him as a man of, very much. of the workers. And very much. What did the conversation lead to next? Well, at one point, uh, he said, you see, this man, uh, he's not going to be reelected. He's been a man that has been giving everybody a lot of troubles, and he's not going to be reelected. You're crazy. He's got all the Democrats behind him. He's a sure thing. No, Jose. He's going to be hit. Well, he said, uh, Jose, he's not going to be reelected. You don't understand me. He's going to be hit. Santos Trapacante, Jimmy Hoffa, Carlos Marcello, three men with both the motive and the means to kill the president. When we come back, we'll look at a conspiracy between two men in Dallas. Two men officials say never even met. But first, we'd like to remind you that our 900 numbers are open for your vote. Dial 1-900-220-2300 to officially reopen the investigation.
Dial 1-900-220-2311 to let the Warren Commission findings stand. In a moment, we'll return to Who Murdered JFK? Adversaries were beginning to gang up on President John F. Kennedy. The Mafia wanted him out of the way. Cuba was in a vengeful mood for all the CIA plots against Castro. And these two powerful forces were coming together. The finishing touches were put together where the assassination would take place, in Dallas. We know of at least two players in Dallas, Lee Harvey Oswald and Jack Ruby. For the last 25 years, we've been told that Oswald and Ruby had never met before the assassination. But you're about to see reenactments of eyewitness accounts indicating that not only had Ruby and Oswald met, they knew each other and could have been co-conspirators. And you will hear other eyewitnesses who corroborate those claims. One of the most disturbing aftermaths of the Kennedy assassination was the murder of accused gunman Lee Harvey Oswald in the basement of the Dallas Police Department. He was shot point blank in the stomach by mob associate and nightclub owner Jack Ruby. Who's this Jack Ruby guy? Jack Ruby had numerous connections to organized crime. He grew up in Chicago, uh, where he was, among other things, a runner for Al Capone. He was uh, brought in for questioning as a suspect in the murder of Leon Cook, who was the head of uh, the Chicago Waste Handlers Union. There was not enough evidence to hold him in custody, and so he was released. And he immediately went to the Chicago Waste Handlers Union. He got a job as an organizer with Paul Dorfman, who was the man who was responsible for introducing Jimmy Hoffa to the mafia in the Midwest uh, back during the early 1940s. During the, the late 40s, the mafia decided to take over the rackets of the Southwest. And Ruby was one of a group of a, about a dozen Chicago hoodlums who came down to Dallas with the mob. Jack Ruby, organized crime figure. But there are others who paint a different picture. Of Ruby. I think the best description would be he was a gopher. The fellow would go for sandwiches in the police station. He was an oddball, a screwball. Um, he was a well-meaning fellow. I think he was mentally ill. Jack Ruby was a hanger-on in the Chicago mob, but he loved the the, uh, the uh, ambiance. He loved the glamour uh, of the of the mobster. Several witnesses told the FBI that when you set up illegal gambling in Dallas, you had to clear it with Jack Ruby. He was pretty much ha controlled the fix of gambling between the police and the mob in, in the city. He was a person that tried to get on the good side of any police officer that he met. The police allowed Jack no favors, anything like that at all. And he never paid them off. He might give them a cup of coffee or something. But Jack liked to think he was in with the police. It gave him a feeling of importance, of being special. He had a in. Jack Ruby's victim, Lee Harvey Oswald, had an equally bizarre past with shadowy connections to espionage and organized crime. He was a man whose short life was marked by contradictions. At the age of 17, he joined the United States Marine Corps. When he was 18, he was sent to the top secret air base at Asugi, Japan. Some say he was working for military intelligence. For the first time I met Oswald, I felt he was working for somebody. And I felt at that time it was naval intelligence. By uh, his obvious knowledge of my background, after receiving an early discharge from the Marines, Oswald traveled to Moscow in 1959, renouncing his U.S. citizenship and proclaiming his intention to sell America's defense secrets to the Soviets. While working at a radio factory in Minsk, Oswald met and married Marina Pruskakova, the niece of an alleged KGB official. In June 1962, Oswald returned to the United States with his wife and infant daughter and settled in Fort Worth, Texas. That in itself says that somebody was giving Oswald highest priority, either because we had trained and sent him there and they went along and, uh, and pretended they didn't know to uh, fake us out, or in fact they had incalculated him and sent him back here 
and were trying to fake us out that way. But he got a green light that no other American had gotten at that period. In 1963, Oswald moved his family to New Orleans, where he founded a local chapter of the Pro Castro Fair Play for Cuba Committee. What are you advocating? We advocate restoration of diplomatic trade and tourist relations with Cuba. Curiously, he shared an address with the city's most virulent anti-Castro organization. I would very definitely say that I, uh, I uh, am a Marxist. That is correct. The unconventional life of Lee Harvey Oswald would take yet another strange turn. We knew, for example, that, that Lee Harvey Oswald was in fact connected to the mob uh, in the following sense. His uncle, a man named Dutz Moret, uh, is a gambler uh, and was uh, connected at least lo loosely to the uh, Carlos Marcello family uh, of the mob in, in New Orleans. His mother had some very mysterious connections to the Marcello operations down in New Orleans. The only thing I'm sure of is that I did not kill President Kennedy. And another thing I'm sure of, I did not raise my children to kill. And Oswald was also very close in 1963 with a man named David Ferry, who was working on a daily basis for Carlos Marcello in the fall of 1963. At the far right is David Ferry in uniform. He was head of the New Orleans Squadron of the Civil Air Patrol. One of his cadets was Lee Harvey Oswald. When Bobby Kennedy had had Carlos Marcello deported in April 1961, around the time of the Bay of Pigs invasion, uh, it was Ferry who flew um, Marcello back into the country illegally. In fact, an informant witnessed Oswald in Marcello's headquarters, the Town & Country Motel in New Orleans, receiving what appeared to be a payment from a Marcello lieutenant. This is a, a scandalous story because Oswald's relationship with organized crime was totally withheld from the American public and from the Warren Commission that investigated the assassination by J. Edgar Hoover, who was uh, calling all the shots. 2.30 a.m., the Lucas B&B &B restaurant. Only 12 hours before the assassination, two waitresses witness a meeting between Jack Ruby and a man they identified as Lee Harvey Oswald. There we are. Thanks. But witnesses claim this secret meeting may have been only one of many contacts between Ruby and Oswald. Thank you. Yeah, take care of them. Testimony suggests a more involved relationship between the two men. Fall 1963, Dallas, Texas, just weeks before the fatal day. One night, uh, Jack uh, had a meeting with several other men, and there were seven at the table with Oswald, being the seventh person. And uh, they were there till about 1 a.m. October 4, 1963, six weeks before the president's trip to Dallas. Their conversation, in effect, was planning to kill Governor Connolly, the governor of the state of Texas, for the purpose of opening up the rackets in Texas. Fall 1963, the date of the president's visit quickly approaches. I was at uh, the Carousel Club, and uh, Jack Ruby was talking to a group of the advertising people, and he said Lee Harvey Oswald had been in the Carousel Club, and he was bragging that he had taken a shot at Major Edwin Walker. That if Jack Ruby was going to hire somebody to kill the President of the United States, he'd probably hire some kind of nut like Oswald. We're back again with Marina Oswald Porter. <laughs> Marina, you heard the reports that your uncle was a member of the KGB at the time you lived in Moscow with Oswald. Is that true? Uh, my uncle has a rank in what you translated in English language as the Ministry of Internal Affairs. I do believe that will be equivalent to American FBI. Did uh, Oswald and your uncle ever meet, ever talk? Of course. Yes, all the time. I mean, that was my family and we always have family dinners and visits all the time and the b men discuss politics and whatsoever and at that, during those conversations I saw Lee as a very proud American he always was 
Boston about young president that was just elected, and that was John F. Kennedy. Well, let me take, excuse me, let me take you sure. back to the weeks before the assassination. <coughs> I understand someone was impersonating Oswald. In fact, didn't you learn that the impersonator was sometimes accompanied by a woman impersonating you? I, after the assassination, I've seen lots of documental when people, uh, uh, certain witnesses, do testify to the fact that uh, they saw Lee buying a car, they saw Lee doing this, saw him drinking, which he did not drink at all. And then at one point, FBI asked uh, ask me to go with them because some witness claim that it was Lee and I being pregnant at the time with certain description of maternity clothes. <clears throat> we were visiting, I think it was a gun shop. So the, I, I don't remember visiting any gun shop, but I told the FBI, since the, my clothes description so correct, maybe I'm just sim simply forgot to lose in my mind. So we went to the place, and it wasn't, I never have been even near this place. Well, thank you very much, Marina. Sure. We're going to have still more questions for you later in the program. Okay. But next will show you that the conspiracy to assassinate President Kennedy started long before Lee Harvey Oswald dusted off that bolt-action rifle in Dallas. Stay with us. Assassination before it happened. Rose Jeremy knew that the president was going to be assassinated. We'll return in a moment with more shocking revelations about who murdered JFK. The conspiracy to assassinate President Kennedy had been brewing in Dallas days before the president arrived. The Warren Commission would later overlook this evidence. Obviously, so did the FBI and the Secret Service. But there were people who knew what would happen. One of the most chilling episodes in our story takes us to a desolate Louisiana back road, two days before the assassination. A waitress who worked the senior bars in Dallas and New Orleans French Quarter, Rose Cheramy, knew many underworld characters. Her employer in Dallas was Jack Ruby. Rose Cheramy was taken to Louisiana State Hospital, where she was later interviewed by the chief of psychiatry, Dr. Victor Weiss. Now for the first time, Dr. Weiss reveals Rose Cheramy's startling story. Rose Sheremy arrived at East Louisiana State Hospital on the 20th of November. She was treated on that unit for rather minor injuries from being thrown from the car. She quite openly and readily told a number of the staff, including the doctors attending her, that she was aware the president was going to be assassinated. Kill him. I gotta get out of here. I can't be part of this. You gotta listen. Okay, let's give it a shot. No, you... Rose Jeremy knew that the president was going to be assassinated, and that it was common knowledge in the quote underground in New Orleans that this was to happen, that the contract had been let. You gotta listen to me. I think you gotta listen to me. I must say in all honesty that I think she had some knowledge of something that was transpiring and had transpired. I had a tendency to believe her story. They're gonna kill the president, damn it, now! Everything's gonna be just fine. Incidentally, the two men that threw her out on the highway were returning to Dallas. It is now November 21st, 1963. For over 1,000 days, John Kennedy has held the office of the presidency. On the night before he's assassinated, the president and his wife arrive in Fort Worth, Texas, continuing his goodwill tour of the state. 
On the last night of his life, the president is left unguarded while his secret service men investigate nightlife at Fort Worth Cellar Club. So who's guarding the president, boys? Hey, don't ask me. Everybody's here. Hi. They showed up about one o'clock and uh, proceeded to uh, just have an awful lot of fun. <laughs> Press. Every place that the president goes, the city supplies two firemen to put on each floor of the hotel in the event of a fire. And if all the Secret Service guys were down here in, in this club playing, that still leaves the two firemen on each floor of the hotel protecting the president because all the Secret Service guys were there. They partied with Dallas strippers, including some from Jack Ruby's Carousel Club who joined in the festivities. As the party heated up, so did tempers. While the president slept, his secret service men continued their party. It began to break up around 5, 5.30. Everybody was just having too much fun. It is the morning of November 22nd. The president will live less than four more hours. It is now 11.37 a.m. The presidential entourage has arrived in Dallas at Love Field. The waiting crowd is enthusiastic. The president and first lady bask in a warm reception from the people of Dallas before leaving for a planned luncheon at the Dallas Trademark. With thousands lining the streets, the presidential motorcade slowly makes its way through downtown Dallas. It will be only a matter of minutes before he arrives at the trademark. I was on Simmons Freeway earlier, and even the freeway was jam-packed with spectators waiting their chance to see the president as he made his way towards the trademark. The president's car is now turning on to Elm Street and passes by the Texas School Book Depository. at least two questions here that were never answered. Why didn't anyone listen to Rose Sheremy? Why wasn't Oswald under active surveillance? The FBI knew he was potentially dangerous. They had a file on him, and they knew he was in Dallas. Now, those are just two of the many questions you might ask yourself as you decide how you're going to vote on the 900 numbers we've provided. You should know enough now to make your decision, but there is even more to know. Join me when we come back to see how modern technology is revealing there was a second gun that day in Dallas. Dial 1-900-220-2300 to officially reopen the investigation. Dial 1-900-220-2311 to let the Warren Commission findings stand. In a moment, we'll return to Who Murdered JFK? It's one of the ironies of the Kennedy assassination that the technology developed by America's space program can now be used to investigate the Dallas tragedy. One of President Kennedy's pledges was to make America number one in space, and that promise got our technologies rolling. Computer enhancement of photographs became a new science, and in this next part of the story, you'll see how we use that new knowledge to show that there was at least a second assassin in Dallas. This is Dealey Plaza in downtown Dallas, a perfect place to kill a president. Behind me is the Texas School Book Depository where shell casings and a rifle were found. Just 50 feet from where John F. Kennedy was shot is this picket fence on a grassy knoll. Could this have been a cover for a second assassin? I saw a man 
moving. He was the only thing in the whole area that was moving. And he was moving away toward the tracks from this, in front of the school book depository rather quickly. And something said to me, go get him. Police officer Joe Smith also ran up the hill in pursuit of a suspect. The crowds followed Officer Smith running toward the elusive gunman spotted on the grassy knoll. I ran across the uh, Elm Street to run up there toward that knoll. It was, uh, and we were stopped by a man in a suit, and he had an overcoat on his, uh, over his arm, and he, he, I saw a gun under that overcoat. And he, his comment was, don't y'all come up here any further, you could get shot or, or kill, one of those words. A man wearing a suit was sighted behind the picket fence at the top of the knoll. He was quickly apprehended by Officer Smith. Stop right where you are. Don't you move now. What you doing here? Gentlemen, gentlemen. United States Secret Service. Okay, partner. It's all right. A few months later, they told me they didn't have an FBI man in that area. If they didn't have anybody, it's a good question who it was. A House Select Committee conducted the last thorough investigation of the John F. Kennedy assassination. This is where the committee believed a second gunman would have stood. Some eyewitness accounts and acoustical evidence agree that at least one bullet was fired from this spot. A certain policeman in Dealey Plaza had noticed the day before the assassination some individuals behind the picket fence overlooking Dealey Plaza uh, appearing to uh, be pointing guns over at the plaza uh, as if they were uh, you know, about to have target practice. At 3M's Comtel Corporation, a firm that specializes in photographic analysis through computerized enhancements, a study of the destruction of the president's brain upon impact proves beyond a doubt that the fatal gunshot came from in front of the president's car. Second frame of impact. It came from Third. the grassy knoll. Third frame. Stand by. The presidential car coming up now. We know it's the presidential car. You see Mrs. Kennedy's pink suit. There's a As the motorcade rushed to Parkland Hospital, the Dallas Police Department rushed to judgment, sending a swarm of officers to investigate the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository. And the first unconfirmed reports say the president was hit in the head. That's an unconfirmed report that the president was hit in the head. Meanwhile, just a few hundred feet from the grassy knoll, three tramps are arrested hiding inside a railroad boxcar. As they're released by the Dallas police, this photo is taken. The man in the center strongly resembles Charles Harrelson, now in prison for murdering a federal judge. Some say the man on the left looks like James Earl Ray, convicted assassin of Martin Luther King. And many believe the third tramp is none other than E. Howard Hunt of Watergate fame. Comtel agreed. Photo enhancement showed a striking resemblance to Hunt. Where were you on the day that John F. Kennedy was assassinated? I was in Washington, D.C. And I have three witnesses uh, who have testified under oath not once but many times as to my presence that day, all of whom were office associates of mine. Now I'd like to show you a picture, a picture taken of three tramps who were in Dealey Plaza on the day of the assassination. I'd like you to look at this picture, and I'd like you to tell me whether one of those tramps could have been you. It's a law of physics that you can't be in uh, two places at the same time, and I, since I was in Washington, D.C., it's quite obvious. I couldn't have been in Dallas. Still, some investigators are concerned about this intriguing letter to a Mr. Hunt asking for details about a meeting in Dallas. It was written shortly before the assassination, signed Lee Harvey Oswald. On the book depository sixth floor, police found three cartridge shells and shortly after a rifle, which they identified as a manlicker carcano. But a deputy sheriff, Roger Craig, insisted that he saw a Mauser, which uses different bullets. He also said the rifle's brand name was altered. On the street below, law enforcement officials and amateurs searched the scene of the shooting, while another crowd gathered outside the hospital walls. Some were mourners, others members of the press. 
but all were joined together in sorrow when the tragic news was announced. John F. Kennedy was dead. Approximately 45 minutes after the assassination, police officer J.D. Tippett was slain by a gunman here. Dallas policemen rushed to the scene to investigate the murder. A tip led them to the Texas theater where a suspicious man had been sighted. Police arrested 24-year-old Lee Harvey Oswald, a self-proclaimed Marxist, and charged him with double homicide for the murders of J.D. Tippett and President John F. Kennedy. They're telling me that he or he, along with someone else, was going to kill Oswald. He knew all of the plans. He knew the uh, decoy assignments. He knew when we were going to move and so forth. He even knew things about the move that I didn't know. When I saw it on television and saw Jack Ruby shooting Oswald, then it seemed like almost instantly I realized that that was Jack Ruby I was talking to last night. He had no choice. Now, when the mob tells you to make the hit, you're going to make the hit. Complete conspiracy, Watson. If you knew the true facts, you'd be amazed at it. In what way? It'll be proven in a few days later what the charges will be filed against me, plus the fact of the assassination. Complete conspiracy against me, Watson. The commission always wanted to interrogate Jack Ruby. The Chief Justice and I, with three or four of our staff, flew to Dallas and interrogated Jack Ruby personally for about five or six hours uh, while he was in the custody of the uh, local authorities in Dallas. Gentlemen, unless you can get me to Washington, you will never see me again, I can tell you that. I want to tell you the truth, but I can't tell it here. Jack Ruby, when he was interviewed in Dallas, wanted to come to Washington. Do you remember that? Well, he was an odd person, Jack. Uh, really a screwball. Did he appear frightened? I don't think Jack Ruby's uh, story in that regard had any credibility whatsoever. We're back with Marina Oswald Porter, live from Dallas. Marina, you told the Ladies Home Journal that you thought organized crime was behind the Kennedy assassination. How did you come to that conclusion? I didn't come to the conclusion just overnight. It took scrupulous, not research, but little by little, since it's happened to me, I was interested what actually happened to me. And I, watched, I read some books, I watched lots of documentals about President life, about Robert Kennedy life, about John, I mean, Edgar Hoover. And accumulation of those little evidence and the documentaries all of a sudden, when I was watching a movie about Robert Kennedy, when he was just portrayed, I mean, it was his life portrayed in television, and all of a sudden come to me that it wasn't John Kennedy that was supposed to be. It, the mob wasn't against John F. Kennedy. They were after Robert Kennedy because he was against mafia. Well, Marina, you may, re house. you may recall, yes. Marina, uh, you yes. may recall that Oswald, after his arrest, told police, he was a patsy. Now, was he a man who could be manipulated by others? I think all of us can be manipulated. Uh, nobody a real exception. I think Lee was m manipulated into the... Do uh, he just had been... I, in my belief that he was working for the government and he was just simply infiltrated groups that were... Uh, and was uh, he was doing what he had been told to do. You think so, he was being used? I think so. Uh, from my own personal experience, I have been used just as well. Do you think it was organized crime that was using him? I don't think so. I thought earlier you said that you thought okay. it was organized crime. Okay, I'm sorry. In my interview with the Ladies Home Journal, I maybe didn't make myself clear because when I read some reviews that they said Marina Oswald uh, think that organized crime Bes uh, beside Lee Harvey as we were involved in the plot. I'm saying that right now that I do believe that organized 
crime was involved in the plot to kill John F. Kennedy. But I'm not saying that Lee was in the, involved in the plot. He was implicated in the plot. And you think unjustly so? You think that he may not have even pulled the trigger? Absolutely. Hmm. Well, after the assassination, you became the Warren Commission's star witness against your late husband. Your testimony, more than any other evidence, helped the Commission reach the conclusion that he was a, a deranged killer, that he acted alone. Uh, clearly, you, you don't believe that now. I do believe right now, when I said that I have been used as well, I believe that I have been used by Warren Commission, and any committee that investigated so dishonestly sometimes, to make Lee a guilty party. Well, did they, uh, how did they handle you? Uh, you feel that they treated you unfairly? Well, 25 years later, you're a little bit older. You look at your life back. I have been living with the guilt for a long time, and it was very convenient. I felt like I was just a, I was very easy mold at the time. I was very young and mature and naive. I have been asked conveniently only the questions that will suit the theory. Well, thank you so very much. Thank you very much, Marina, for spending this time with us tonight. And thanks for sharing your knowledge of the tragedy. You're welcome. Next, remember Johnny Roselli, the man who started me on this search 20 years ago? Well, he had a lot more to say about the mob's involvement. So stay with us. There were few men who knew more about the mob than Johnny Roselli did. It had been his life. And there were fewer still who knew more about the Mafia's involvement in the plot to kill President Kennedy. As our relationship grew over the years, he was telling me more and more. <laughs> In my final meetings with Johnny Roselli, he told me the rest of the story about the Cuban snipers who had attempted to kill Castro. What he had left out in earlier meetings was the most shocking revelation of all. I never saw those guys again. But I heard that they were caught in torture. Castro's boys are pretty persuasive because I heard the word came back that the hit team we sent was turned around. They were sent back to the U.S. to kill Kennedy. Castro must have figured that the CIA was sent in. Kennedy knew about it and was part of it. Kennedy probably wasn't such a big deal to our guys. Well, the truth is they hated his guts. Bobby's all over everybody, everywhere all the damn time. After all, we helped him get elected. I bought votes for him in Illinois myself. Anyway, they were all over us. The word was, Kennedy had to go. Johnny 
Roselli, the self-styled strategist, had revealed a web of intrigue that made headlines about the mafia, the CIA, Castro, and JFK's assassination. But that was just the beginning of his revelations. The way I heard it, the Cubans handed over Oswald. They figured he was a perfect fall guy, a real crackpot. They said he was good with a rifle. Not that it mattered. Kennedy was going down that day whether he hit his mark or not. Oswald was a patsy or a chump, really. His uncle or something ran the numbers in New Orleans. Ruby was one of our guys, strictly small time. He started like I did in Chicago with Capone. But he was strictly an errand boy, that's all. That's all he did. Anyway, he was in real good with the Dallas cops, and when we gave him the call, he responded. He didn't have a choice, really. Oswald had to go. He just knew too much. At least that's what I heard. Roselli's story was later supported by Senate committee hearings when George McGovern testified about his own meetings with Fidel Castro. During nine hours of conversation with Prime Minister Castro on a visit to Cuba in early May of this year, the issue of CIA-inspired assassination attempts against Cuban leaders was discussed testified about his own meetings with Fidel Castro. During nine hours of conversation with Prime Minister Castro on a visit to Cuba in early May of this year, the issue of CIA-inspired assassination attempts against Cuban leaders was discussed at some length. Mr. Castro told me that the CIA was involved in a number of efforts to assassinate him and other Cuban leaders. Later on, uh, this matter came up with his brother Raul, the defense minister. And I must say it was no laughing matter with him. There was no joking around about it. What exactly did Raul say? He said, let me tell you, if any one of those attacks uh, had succeeded, I can tell you that I would have found some way uh, to retaliate. At the Brazilian embassy, Fidel Castro himself delivered an unprecedented message only two months before the Kennedy assassination. He told Associated Press correspondent Daniel Parker that if attempts to eliminate Cuban leaders continued, American leaders would not be safe. Ironically, Santos Traficante was playing both ends against the middle by sending snipers to Cuba for the CIA, while at the same time warning Castro of their arrival. There was intelligence that uh, Santos Traficante was doing business with Castro. Do you know anything about it? When Castro took control of Cuba, he seized all the American casinos and all their assets and threw all the operators in jail, including Traficante. And then, suddenly Traficante is released with all his assets. Several of the, uh, the, of the people that were on one of the missions were captured in Cuba and tortured. And uh, the assumption was that he was part of that. The thought went to my mind, Traficante is working for Castro, or he's working through Castro's agents here. He's the contact. Traffic Candy came out with all his money. Immediately went into business. And look how big he got overnight. He spread out all over the South. Of course, he, he teamed up with Marcello, and he has some Chicago interests, too. Marcello was very high in the United States in the uh, hierarchy. You know, he was very high. I can't see anybody in the South, even if, if Traficante was on a peer level with him, he'd still have to go through Marcello. I think Carlos Marcello is the key figure behind the assassination. 
Uh, his territory included Dallas, and his fingerprints come up in the assassination case again and again and again. When Carlos Marcello testified before the House Select Committee, he denied any involvement in the Kennedy assassination. Santos Traficante also appeared before the committee, but he contemptuously took the fifth and revealed nothing. Sam Giancana, who, like Johnny Roselli, had received a subpoena from the Senate, was enjoying retirement in his Oak Park, Illinois home. One week before his scheduled testimony, as he was preparing a midnight snack in his basement kitchen, he was surprised by an uninvited guest. of course notes of interest that uh, Mr. Giacano was done away with. He had uh, been contacted by some of our staff uh, in the matter of trying to get information on the Roselli matter. It's obvious who hit him. He was Traficani hiding on his yacht. He did not want any exposure because he was given the guarantee by Johnny. So he had to stop Sam. They didn't want him to take that stand. But they found the gun weeks later in the field. It was a 22 with a silencer. Where did it come from? Florida. That was a professional hit. Definitely. And the first bullet hit him back here. Now, when he fell down, the rest of the bullets were grouped around his mouth. That's the old mob sign, don't talk. Roselli appeared before the Senate committee on Monday of the following week, just four days after Giancana's murder. In secret testimony, he told what he knew, in part, calmly, as if he were eating breakfast. Tom Wadden and I appeared with John when he uh, was called before the Senate committee, and we were present during his testimony. Did the committee ask him about the assassination of John F. Kennedy? John testified that... He was napping. Uh, he was awakened from his nap and was, was told that uh, President Kennedy had been assassinated. And his first reaction was, the Cubans must have gotten him. Eventually, he said he knew who the assassins were. I never did. He never did tell me the names, but I know he didn't did speak of it in Washington, D.C. And this is not something that he would have invented? No. No. He was too shrewd to do that. Roselli's credibility was further investigated during the House Select Committee hearings in 1979, which affirmed a conspiracy theory involving a second assassin or assassins. Either Roselli guessed it, uh, uh, or it was true. And for Roselli to say that he knew that Cubans connected to Traficante had done it, and that the fatal shot was from up front was contrary to the official story but is wholly consistent with what an insider having access for example to what the shooter behind the deposit i mean behind the, the the fence would have said that there was a, a ring of truth johnny roselli would become the man who knew too much and he would eventually pay the price that's next but first, you still have time to judge the evidence you've seen tonight by using our 900 numbers. At the beginning of this program, we gave you a list of the major players in this complicated story and told you that most of them had been brutally murdered. That's true. But it's not all of the truth. For several years after the president's assassination in Dallas, witnesses and informants began dropping dead like so many autumn leaves in November. One of the first to drop, my best informant, Johnny Roselli. Come on, John, we catch the big one today, huh? This is where huh? we get the big one. In 1976, Johnny Roselli had retired to Florida. On a balmy afternoon, he went deep-sea fishing with some unidentified friends. 
in the warmth of the afternoon sun, he may have forgotten that he was still in the cold shadow of Santos Traficante. These big ones are hitting today, John. Huh? This is the place, Al. I'm glad you guys talked me into this today. Oh, thanks, Tony. Thanks. We're going to get a big one today. Hey, Tony, get him a drink, huh? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Al. Good day, Professor. I missed this. I know. I'm getting a drink. Sure, sure. Al, I think I got one. Al, come here. I think I got one, Al. Santos was definitely looking to have him hit. Sorry, Johnny. You talk too much. He called him Johnny in the drum. He wasn't supposed to pop back up. That was uh, somebody made a mistake. In just three short years after the assassination, 18 material witnesses died by gunfire, karate chops, and slashed throats. According to the London Sunday Times, the odds of all these witnesses being killed so soon after testifying is 100,000 trillion to one. We haven't tried to be a court of law here tonight, but we have investigated the assassination of President Kennedy and we've found compelling evidence that contradicts the official verdict. We've presented that to you, and you've responded with your verdict. There has been an overwhelming response from you, voting on whether to reopen the Kennedy assassination probe. As of a few minutes ago, 213,178 Americans have voted. Of those, 209,934 voted to reopen the investigation and 3,244 voted to keep the status quo. Obviously, Americans want to know more from our officials. By the way, you can vote on these 900 numbers up to 12 noon Eastern time tomorrow. The remaining question tonight is why? Why did the government cover up the facts surrounding Kennedy's assassination? The first reason is that President Johnson was fearful of provoking a world war that could involve the Soviet Union. To understand this, you must remember the times. Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev had just been humiliated at home by backing down during the Cuban Missile Crisis. He had been backed into a corner, and a cornered Khrushchev could be dangerous. He had made a deal with President Kennedy that if he pulled Soviet missiles out of Cuba, we would not invade the island. Now, if we violated this promise, he could not afford to back down again. He could be forced by pressures at home to take action. It could lead to war. Shortly after Kennedy was shot, President Johnson got a secret briefing from the CIA informing him that, first, Castro was behind the assassination, and second, Castro reportedly acted because of the CIA's efforts, using the mob, to kill him. President Johnson felt, rightly or wrongly, that the American people could not be told this. They would demand retaliation against Cuba, which might have forced Khrushchev to act. This could have meant World War III. Johnson had been president for only a couple of days. He couldn't take that chance. Besides, the truth was embarrassing. The world would learn that the CIA was plotting to assassinate a foreign leader. Not only that, but with the help of mafia killers. Not only that, but the plot was bungled. And not only that, the plot was botched so badly it caused the assassination of their own president. It was just too much to allow the American people to know, and the consequences too great. So Johnson and his advisors felt that it was better that Americans not know the truth and we may not know the whole truth for decades. Not until the involved government agencies, particularly the CIA, can no longer be damaged by our learning who really murdered John F. Kennedy. Some may differ on the interpretation of these facts, but we are convinced they represent what actually happened. I'm Jack Anderson. Good night.
Stay tuned for local news, weather, and sports next on Tampa Bay Tonight on your 44.